live here at Wisdom Harbor Studios. I'm Andy Andrews. You joined us on the Blue Plate Special in beautiful downtown Orange Beach. We're in the final financial district of Orange Beach here at the Wharf, uh, home of the world famous escalator statues here at the Wharf and home of Wisdom Harbor Studios. And really kind of all, all the stuff that goes on on the Gulf Coast really kind of comes through here. We're it's like, we're like right here. I, I tell my friends, I'm the only person you'll ever meet who can give you directions to my house on a national map. If you look at where Florida touches Alabama, right on the line, as far south as you can go, that's where we are. So when those hurricanes are coming out of the Caribbean, we are praying them over to the East Coast, and of course, they're praying them into the Gulf. And so we're, we're hoping there are more Christians in the Gulf of Mexico to strengthen that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you're here. And uh, if this is your first time, you won't be surprised that somebody got you here and this is kind of ridiculous. This is what we do on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And uh, we say hi to the people from around Serena Skull Garner from the 4-H Center in Ferndale, Arkansas. Wow. Hmm. Jamie Futrell there in Kentucky. How are things in Kentucky? I got something I'm going to say about Kentucky on the show today. We got a, a good historical show for you today. Uh, Margaret Davis hopped from uh, wet, sunny, from wet and sunny northeast Mississippi. Tammy Nance, Shenandoah Valley. Hello, Tammy Nance. Um, Jeff Herring. Glad you're with us. You like the shirt? The shirt is from Sand Dollars, which is the cornerstone of the, the wharf right here in Orange Beach, and uh, they have millions of shirts, literally millions of shirts. And if you if you go in, you can uh, get a camel caravan to take you through the aisles and shop. And Christy Woods, my sister, is here. Well, and Chris Comer. Yeah, I am. I am sounding better. I had a, I had a throat, like a throat thing last week and it it was it like like leapt upon me it was it was not good marcy cross taylor from pasco washington bobby mills from west virginia Avi jean hodge hey from elkin north carolina well if you're if you're joining us on facebook we would we would ask that you click that notification button and turn the notifications on on your phone. That way you'll be notified anytime we go live. And if you're on YouTube or LinkedIn, LinkedIn, loosen your ties. We're glad to have you here. Um, Instagram, Twitter. Hi, Andy. It's Shelly from Northeast Louisiana. I have been on your radio show several times. How about that? Was that you? Artie Hill. Um, Pleasant, Pennsylvania. Now, see, that's it's like he's he, he, somebody who's like make up a. a wait, I mean, I was thinking, what would you name your town if you could start over? <laughs> Pleasant. Yeah, <laughs> Pleasant. Yeah, let's let's name it Pleasant because there's some towns that they didn't get a good start. You know, I mean. It, I mean, hell, Michigan. They ended up making it. Yeah, they 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 ended up doing well because of that. I think their post office does well because people go, yeah, sending you greetings from hell, you know. But but I I, I can't. I mean, how did that place get to? Well, this is hell. Well, let's just call it hell. I don't know. And there's in North Carolina, smack ass gap. Yeah. I don't know. There's, you know, up up in uh, near Montgomery, there's slap out, slap out, 
So, Sandy Kirk, Jeff Litchford, um, Andy, you're an American icon. I am an icon. Hmm. How about that? It says I'm an American icon. And um, in studio, we have Jackie from... Where's Jackie? Where's Jackie? In the studio? From Arab, Alabama? She must have gone to get coffee. She must have gone to get coffee. Now, see, I was... You know, I, I was... I was pausing before I said Arab because that's that's one of those kind of names that you you think. I mean, that could be. I mean, somebody today somebody might say that was offensive, like, "Well, I'm from Arab, Alabama. You can't say that. It's offensive." Oh, I'm sorry. I'm from. I'm from Arab, Alabama. Johnny Hall has a lizard lick North Carolina. <sighs> Francis Kraft, Nawbone, Sammy from Bluntsville, Alabama. In studio, Sammy from Bluntsville. Where's Sammy? Probably with Jackie. Probably with Jackie, <laughs> I guess. I guess. Okay. We got a bunch of people in the studio today. Hunter from Birmingham, Hunter Bob, Hunter Dawson, Christy from Auburn. In, you know uh, Aaron and Sherry are from Auburn, right there too. Matt, Kevin, and Stephanie from Gulf Shores, right there. You know, Gulf Shores is our Dallas. You know, it's it's like I I think I think it's funny because pe because when I travel, I, I'll tell people. I mean, I'm just used to saying I'm from Orange Beach, and they go, "You're from Gulf Shores," and I go. Well, yeah, yeah, you know, because it, people, it's like, you're, you're, from, you're from Orange Beach? You're, you mean Gulf Shores? Yeah, because, and that's what people do in Dallas, you know, you, 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 if you go to, you should say, so, are you from Dallas? No, I'm from Fort Worth. And people in Minneapolis, are you, are you from Minneapolis? No. I'm from St. Paul. You remember, remember the Christmas concert a couple of years ago? We had uh, who was the guy? Uh, oh, 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 who's the guy? Oh, uh, Aaron Neville. That, that 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 was my Aaron Neville impression. Oh, 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 oh. I just an attempt to do Aaron Neville, um, but Aaron Neville said, "I mean, he's right over here at Sir." Sir and he's like, hey, it's great to be here in Gulf Shores. And people go, Orange Beach, it's Orange Beach. And I'm like, God, Marty, what the, you know, it's like, he's okay, okay. Who cares? Jerry Robertson from Toad Suck. You, you'd take Orange Beach or Gulf Shores, wouldn't you? You live in Toad Suck. Okay, Tom Cole. Hey. Let me tell you about the new um, Life Skills Project before we get going on this show. And, I, and you, I know if you're new here, you're going, you're not already going? No, we hadn't already started. We're, we're not even started yet. We're not even official. But as many of you are aware from uh, this week's podcast, if you, if you got it, and, and I saw yesterday's email, we're gearing up for the launch of a new course called the Life Skills Project, a study sessions. These are uh, continuing education for uh, businesses, for, uh, for schools, and these sessions are an eight-week study of several of my books, including The Traveler's Gift, The Seven Decisions, The Noticer, The Noticer Returns, The Heart Mender, and The Little Things. Each class is taught by a hand-picked Coach, I picked them with this hand. Yes, he did. This hand, the hand-picked coach, and they and they actually consist of uh, weekly sixty to seventy-five minute Zoom sessions plus a workbook, PDF, and a certificate of completion signed by me and by your coach. These are continuing education courses. 
Each class is, is uh, $129. You can add a copy of the book for the class for 25% off retail and free shipping. You can use your own copy if you already have a book, or you can go into a bookstore and do it on Zoom and just like not even pay for the book. So we'll be opening doors for enrollment next week, but we want to give priority seating to those who are already interested in joining. If you, if you sign up for the wait list today, we'll let you know before anybody else, you can purchase your seat. So classes are going to fill up quickly. And once they do, you'll have to wait until the next class opens, which would, of course, be eight weeks longer or, you know, after the first class starts. So click the link in the chat box and head over to andyandrews.com slash life skills. Okay? It's andyandrews.com slash life skills. And, and this, is, this is going to be fun. You know, the coaches, I've got... Kevin Perkins, who's been my best friend since high school, is coaching the noticer. Which, you know, I've put the mojo on him. I said, you cannot tell. There are certain things you just cannot tell. And, and so, Tammy Nance is doing the little things, and Jamie Futrell's doing the... Uh, What's Jamie? Jamie's doing the seven decisions. Um, Kevin Williams, you know, the musical director for Bill Gaither is doing uh, is doing the heart mender. And so Kevin, Kevin's way too funny. He's too, he, he, we might have to kick him out for being too funny. Probably so. <laughs> yeah. He'll have one class. <laughs> Jimmy Yeary is here with us today. Jimmy, we're glad to have you here. Jimmy is the songwriter of... I drive your truck, you know, I drive your truck, and yeah, you do, yeah, you do, you've heard that. It's a CMA Song of the Year, Kevin Corcoran, oh my God, and the ACM Song of the Year. He, uh, I Called Mama, Tim McGraw, I Called Mama. And um, let's see, Jimmy wrote the last the last three Kenny Chesney number ones. Kevin Perkins, the old man is here. Kevin Perkins. Uh, Kevin, I just told I just told him you you got to limit yourself on your stories on the noticer. So just Dan Stone is doing the traveler's gift. That's gonna be awesome. I mean, that, I mean, that's, who else? Hey, I'm forgetting somebody. I know I'm forgetting somebody. Let's see. Chris Comer. Was it Chris? Chris Comer? Yeah, Chris Comer is doing uh, the Notice of Returns, and so. And we got J Jamie. Did you say him already? Jamie, Jamie Futrell, yeah. You know, on the Blue Plate Special, we often try to give you, uh, some of some of the the best information available and this is just like off the top of our heads and and so sometimes it's uh historical sometimes it's hysterical uh but we we don't know what it'll be and that's part of the charm of this show it's not like the it's not like the uh, it's not like the the podcast. You know, the podcast, when, we, when we've got the professional noticer, that's more, you know, that's edited and it's formal and it's, we're delivering this material and, and, but, you know, this blue plate special, this is pretty free range. This is organic, free range, cage free material, I think. And it, and, and I don't think there will be a single word that I will say here today that is not gluten-free. I think everything will be gluten-free today. Uh, Kevin Ferguson says his non-disclosure agreement is not yet signed. Okay, so today is April 14th. And I thought that we would examine, since we have, since we have some people from the Board of Education 
in today. They're examining us for certification. They're examining us carefully. I, I thought that we ought to dive into history and be as boring as we possibly could today. <laughs> you know, I, I, I got to tell you, I, I, I love history. I love history. And I didn't always love it. But I, I think I would have loved it earlier if I had just had a teacher who'd walked into the classroom and said, okay, put down your books. Today, I'm going to tell you a story. I mean, if I just had a teacher to, you know, if, you know, I, I mean, I mean, think about, think about the imagination that a history teacher could bring to the table for, for a history class. I mean, you, you know, you, you got, you got tr true or false. I mean, I remember true or false. The Civil War started in 1852. True or false? F. Robert E. Lee was from Virginia. True or false? True. I mean, I had to learn this stuff. I had to learn this stuff, much less, I mean, I, 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 I couldn't stay awake taking the test. I mean, if I was a teacher, if I was a teacher, I would have, I'd give them true or false, like, I don't know, I'd throw something in there I'd throw something in there to just make sure they're awake. You know, I mean, just, let's just throw some false stuff in there and see if anybody calls me on it. All right, so, so in fact, let's do that today. Let's do that today. Today is April 14th. We're gonna go back in history. We're gonna tell you what happened on this date in April 14th, the Ides of April. The Ides, I think they call this the Ides of April. And, and so on April 14th, in 1932, you know what happened in America in 1932? Very important day. Loretta Lynn was born in Butcher Hollow, Kentucky on April 14th, 1932. This, it, it, Loretta was a singer who greatly expanded the opportunities for women in a male-dominated world of country music. She met her future husband, Oliver Doolittle Lynn, when she was only 13. They married, and a year later, she gave birth to her first child when she was 14 years old. Lynn had three more children before she was 21 and was a grandmother when she was 29. <laughs> I'm not making that up. You know, I've been to Loretta Lynn's uh, planned, like, house or whatever. That thing. Yeah. I, I don't remember hearing that on the history tour. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's true. I, I did some stuff with Loretta. She was really nice. Even for coming from Butcher Hollow? That, that sounds like a made-up town name. Well, she, she pronounced it Butcher Holler. She didn't pronounce it Butcher Hollow. Um... It's spelled Butcher Hollow, but she pronounced it Butcher Holler. And, um, you know, unlike some country music singers who sang about a working class life, but lived an urban existence, I mean, Loretta, her, I mean, her country roots were pretty unquestionable, okay? She, she was born in a log cabin 
nestled in the backwood hills of Kentucky with no running water or indoor plumbing, born in a log cabin. She wore a coonskin cap, and every, every day she went to school and she would kill squirrels with a rifle that she called Betsy, old Betsy. No? Okay, so that was Davy Crockett, but she was born in a, in a log cabin. And her daddy was a coal miner. Cause so that would that part was false. That part was false. Just a little part of false. Because so while listening to her sing to her children, Doolittle became convinced that Loretta sang as well as anybody on the radio. And for her 26th birthday, Doolittle bought Loretta a $17 guitar and encouraged her to learn to play. And she eventually began to play and sing with local bands and in 1960 released her first recorded single, I'm a Honky Tonk Girl. It was actually it was supposed to be titled I'm a Honky, I'm a honky Tonk Grandmother. <laughs> but they thought, you know, you're 29, you probably shouldn't be, you know, putting that out there. But... But anyway, Doolittle, Do had a knack for public relations, and he shrewdly mailed copies of the song to radio stations before they went on tour. And Honky Tonk Girl became her first hit by the mid-'80s, or, or actually by the mid-'60s. She was one of the most successful female performers in country music. And in previous decades, male performers and masculine themes had dominated the 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 country music landscape it, this supposedly the virile nature of the american west and the rural working class life and women performers largely kind of conform to these standards after world war ii a handful of female country artists began to challenge their subordinate status and surprisingly given her rural background Loretta became one of their leaders, and many many of her songs talked about her feminine strength and determination and a sense that women would no longer stand by their man, as other singers like to suggest that they would. Her perceptive business sense, and she did have a business sense, and talent for self-promotion demonstrated that women could thrive in this competitive music industry. In 1967, the Country Music Association recognized... Now, now think about this. This is 1967 before they did this. They, they recognized the new importance of women singers, and it wasn't until 1967 that they ever gave a female vocalist of the year award, and she got the first one. In 67, she continued to enjoy great success in the 70s, and then there's an account of her life on film, Coal Miner's Daughter, with Sissy Spacek, who uh, also was in a horror movie that, uh, what was that, what, that one, you know, where the blood... Came down on her. Uh, Carrie? Carrie, yeah. Yeah, Carrie. Yeah. That, that's not a good, that's not a good, good connection. I was born a coal miner's daughter with the, the blood, yeah. But, but whole new generation of fans in 1980, and she continues to bring a compelling female perspective to the world of country music. Now, let me just tell you, I have been backstage with Loretta at, uh, at the Grand Ole Opry and Tammy. I wasn't really sure that Loretta and Tammy liked each other. I'm just saying. But, but back in the 80s, you know, I, I worked as a comedian and I was, I was up in Nashville a lot and I, I was... Uh, I was backstage, and I, I remember seeing some, some like, turning the other way. But George, you know, that, that was, the, the, big, the big snubs were not really between the women, but were, 
I remember like George, you know, George and Tammy, George, Tammy, George Jones, Tammy Wynette. And George had this song called, If Drinking Don't Kill Me, Her Memory Will. And, and, uh, and George was, he, he was like a, a, a big, big, uh, it, it, people would like hold up signs, George and Tammy forever. And he was known for not showing up at shows, for getting drunk and then not showing up. In fact, I was booked at a, at like a total of 20 shows with George Jones. And I actually performed 11 of them with him because he didn't show up. Wow. Yeah. And, um, but those things happen. You know, I, I actually did, uh, I did 45 minutes in front of, uh, in, in, in front, in front of, uh, Jerry Reed one time who did a song and a half in Hot Springs, Arkansas and said, Good night, everyone. <laughs> hey Jerry. Good night. But uh but but uh yeah, um George Jones did If Drinking Won't Kill Me, Her Memory Will. Now he had already married he, he and Tammy had gotten divorced and he had married another woman. And so, but I remember way after he had married the other lady, he was still singing in his shows. He would get to the end of the song, and a drinking don't kill me, Tammy's memory will. And people would go, and, and, and I always thought, Oh my gosh, you know, I mean, his wife's back says he's got to go back and face that, but I guess he would rather have the, have the applause. Okay. All right. So on this date, the best Oscar, the best actress Oscar was announced on October 14th on this date, 1969. The 41st Annual Academy Awards were broadcast live to a television audience in 37 nations. It was the first time the awards had been televised worldwide, as well as the first Oscar ceremony to be held in the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion of the Los Angeles Music Center. Adding to the momentous nature of the night was a first ever in a major acting category. Katherine Hepburn and Barbara Streisand were up for Best Actress. Hepburn was nominated for The Lion in Winter. Streisand was nominated for Funny Girl. Ingrid Bergman undid the envelope and said, and the Oscar goes to, it's a tie. It was a tie. And Barbara Streisand walked up on the stage and slapped Katherine Hepburn in the face. Okay, on this date, on this date, April 14th, on this date, the first Pony Express rider actually arrived in San Francisco with mail originating from St. Joseph, Missouri. So these runs on this Pony Express thing were usually about 75 to 100 miles long, during which the rider changed horses from four to seven times. Uh, home stations were established along the route about every 75 miles, and the exact placement was determined by the terrain and, where possible, by the availability of an already established facility, such as this fort or a stagecoach stop. Like relay stations, home stations had horse stalls and a corral. And when the rider arrived at a home station, he removed the saddlebags from his horse and threw it over the fresh horse. And then the new rider would be off. For the first few weeks of service, riders carried a rifle as well as a pistol. But it soon became apparent that rifles were too heavy and awkward to be practical. So the riders stopped carrying them. 
Some riders carried horns to signal the relay station of their approach. What kind of horns? Like a an air horn? Yeah, probably. Yeah. It scared the horse. Um, but Pony Express riders faced a host of perils. In addition to the discomfort and the danger of the rough terrain, harsh weather, insects, and scarce water on the trail, hostile Indians threatened riders and station keepers alike. Maybe they wouldn't have been so hostile if they hadn't called them Indians. There you go. If they called them Native Americans, maybe they wouldn't have been as hostile. Maybe they would have, like, come out and given them a sandwich. But I did the research, and this is very, this is very curious. This was the pledge that the Pony Express riders had to say they put their right hand on the Bible. Seems weird to hold your left hand up, but they put their right hand on the Bible and they'd say, I, and whatever the name was, I, Cactus Bob, do hereby swear before the great and living God that during my engagement and while I am an employee of Russell, Majors, and Waddell, I will under no circumstances use profane language, that I will drink no intoxicating liquors, that I will not quarrel or fight with any other employee of the firm, and that in every respect I will conduct myself honestly, be faithful to my duties, and so direct all my acts as to win the confidence of my employer. I will also make my bed, so help me God. Okay, the bed part wasn't in there, but, but the other part was. So those who had seriously violated this oath, they would be fired. <coughs> and this was with the loss of back pay. I mean, can you imagine somebody coming in to... Pony Express said, hey, I heard him cuss back there. I heard him cuss. He's fired. I saw him drinking intoxicating liquor. He's fired. Now, this is not to say that the Pony Express riders were saints. No. But in most cases, they were devoted to their task. And they approved their loyalty again and again. Among the best-known riders was... Uh, William Cody, Buffalo Bill, whose adventures rank among the most exciting in the annals of the mail service, including one nearly continuous 22-hour ride in Wyoming from Red Butte Station to Pacific Springs and back a distance of some 300 miles, 400 kilometers. There were also dramatic accounts of Buffalo Bill's heroic escapes from Indians and highwaymen Though some of his exploits were, were creations <coughs> of dime novelists and publicity people, you know. But, but among the service's most storied writers was a guy named Pony Bob. Pony Bob Haslam was a holder of the record for the longest and fastest run in the history of the Pony Express. This much celebrated run began in May 1860 and began at Friday's station on the southwest shore of Lake Tahoe and took Haslam east on his normal route to Buckland Station through, without the benefit of a relief horse, and then on to another 90-mile trek through hostile Paiute territory when the next rider was scared about the Indian threat and having ridden 190 miles in that single day this guy turned around and went right back this time replacing a rider who did not show up and rescuing a station master from hostile Native Americans along the way in the end he traveled about 360 miles in 40 hours that courage 
stamina, and reliability made Haslam a logical choice to carry a particularly important dispatch. And he was the one who carried the news of Abraham Lincoln's election to the presidency. Haslam. How about that? Speaking of Lincoln, on this day, April 14th, shortly after 10 p.m., John Wilkes Booth entered the presidential box at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., and fatally shot President Abraham Lincoln. As Lincoln slumped forward in his seat, Booth leapt onto the stage and escaped out the back door. The paralyzed president was immediately examined by a doctor in the audience and then carried across the street to the Peterson house where he died early the next morning. Lincoln's assassination was the first presidential assassination in U.S. history. Booth carried out the attack five days after General Robert E. Lee had surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia to General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. And he thought that his action would aid the South. The, the suspicion that Booth had acted as part of a conspiracy of Southern sympathizers increased the Northern rage and whether Lincoln would have been able to temper the Reconstruction policies that were enacted by the Radical Congress is left to speculation because of his untimely death as, as the United States transitioned from the Civil War from re reunification and peace. And so within days of the assassination, the War Department issued wanted posters for the arrest of Booth and his accomplices, which was John Surratt and... David Harold, Booth and Harold eluded capture until April 26, when federal troops discovered them hiding in a tobacco barn near Bowling Green, Virginia. Harold surrendered, but Booth stayed undercover and was shot as the barn burned to the ground. He died later that day. Booth's co-conspirators, Lewis Powell, who had attempted to murder Secretary of State William Seward, George Al Zarat, David Harold, and Mary Surratt all were executed for their part in the assassination conspiracy. Uh, Mary Surratt had the, had the boarding house that they stayed in, and she was assassinated too. Uh, I mean, she was executed too. Several other conspirators were sentenced to imprisonment. The death of President Lincoln resulted in an outpouring of grief Nationwide, it was something that the nation had not experienced at the time. At the White House and lying in state at the U.S. Capitol, Lincoln's body was transported to the railway station where it began a 1,700-mile journey to Springfield, Illinois. And on May 4th, Lincoln was finally laid to rest in a tomb at the Oak Ridge Cemetery where the Oak Ridge Boys sang the national anthem. Many monuments were built to honor Abraham Lincoln over the years, across the nation, around the world. On April 14th, April 14th, 1876, the 11th anniversary of the event, Frederick Douglass delivered an oration at the unveiling of a monument to Lincoln which is located in Washington, D.C.'s Lincoln Park, and he said, dying as he did die by the red hand of violence, killed, assassinated, taken off without warning, not because of personal hate, but because of his fidelity to union and liberty, he is doubly dear to us, and his memory will be precious forever, buried at the Oak Ridge Cemetery, and his son, Robert Todd Lincoln, was known to have, um, the rest of the day, walked around saying, Um Papa Mau Mau.
No? Not buying that part? Okay, well, it was the Oak Ridge Cemetery. It was the Oak Ridge Cemetery. Okay. All right, here's the last one. And you're going to love this one. April 14th. April 14th. This day in history. At about 11.40 p.m. tonight. 1912. The Titanic struck an iceberg. Yo! Ah, oh, you like that? You got to, hey, we're going on a cruise. Hey, we're going on a cruise. Off the coast of Newfoundland began sinking. Titanic was on its maiden voyage from Southampton to New York when the tragedy occurred. A later investigation showed the ship had failed to follow all safety procedures beside traveling through dangerous waters at high speed after receiving repeated warnings concerning the presence of icebergs. Icebergs! 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 The Titanic also had aboard an insufficient number of lifeboats for the passengers and crew. The band played Nearer My God to Thee as the ship went down. It took two hours and 40 minutes to go down, taking the lives of 1,517 people. Now, while there was released an official count, in reality, over a hundred unidentified bodies were buried in Fairview Lawn Cemetery in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Many people on board had traveled under false names, and from so many different places, it proved impossible to identify even the recovered bodies. Sidney Leslie Goodwin, a 19-month-old boy buried under the marker Unknown Child, was identified in 2008 after extensive DNA tests and a worldwide genealogical search. By the way, the violin that was played by Wallace Hartley as the ship was going down, and the violin that was playing Nearer My God to Thee, it was thought to have been lost in the sinking, but in 2006, a woman found it in her attic. And after seven years of testing, researchers determined that it was, in fact the actual violin upon which Hartley famously played Nearer My God to Thee as the Titanic sank. It was played by this band leader, Wallace Hartley, who died along with 1,517 passengers and crew on board as the ship went down, and the violin sold at auction for $1.4 million dollars. Did you see the movie? You did. I did not. I did not see the movie because I was in line. I was in line, and somebody said, "Yeah, you know that." I understand the ship sinking is so realistic, and I'm like, "It sinks." Thanks for ruining the movie, and I, I didn't. I didn't even see it. <sighs> Thinking I'm not going to do that. So, all right, you guys, that's it for today, April 14th, and um, we'd love to get you signed up on the Life Skills Project, love to get you going on wisdomharbor.com, and uh, we'll see you on Thursday. Thursday is uh, the next Blue Plate Special. We appreciate you being with us wherever you are in the world. And um, that's it. Bye-bye.